much to our last presentation of the Historic Ball for joining us tonight. I won't spend too much time introducing this evening's guest speaker since he presented a talk this past summer on Kettle Island, which as I mentioned, you can find on our website. But I will give you a short reminder of why we're fortunate to have Randy Boswell as our guest speaker tonight and also to have him as a member of the Historical Society of Ottawa. Randy spent many years with the Ottawa Citizen and Post Media News, where in addition to the, being at City Hall, the City Hall correspondent, he developed the National History Column. Randy became a full-time professor at Carleton in 2012 and recently has been doing a lot of teaching online through Zoom, so he's comfortable with the format tonight. Randy was the 2010 winner of the Eves 4 j Earth Science Journalism Award, and he recently edited a collection of essays related to Sir John A. Macdonald. And I bring that up because I suspect he would be a prominent character in tonight's presentation. Uh, among his journalism topics is the subject of political and ethical issues facing the profession, and that's appropriate since politics and ethics are very much a part of what Randy is going to be speaking about tonight. So will you please welcome our guest speaker tonight, Randy Boswell. Hi, folks. Um, I'm not sure exactly how you will see what I'm seeing, but um, yeah, I, I know Richard said that I'm very familiar with Zoom, but it's all still a bit of a mystery to me. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen so that rather than looking at me, you can look at um, all kinds of pictures and things that I've put together for this presentation um, uh, to uh, help get across the, um, uh, you know, the issues that I'm going to be talking about. So I'm going to do that now, and you guys just confirm that you can see what I'm seeing. Upheaval yes. across Canada's commemorative landscape. Yes. Um, uh, I think um, um, there's an array of uh, images here that uh, capture the fact that obviously right now in Canada, and it's not just Canada, the United States and Great Britain and other countries are um, experiencing a similar reckoning with their past. And this is playing out in um, some conspicuous ways. Um, you know, uh, landmarks um, are coming under fire for having paid tribute to uh, individuals in the past whose dark sides um, uh, were, I guess, underrepresented in um, the history, uh, the accumulated history. Uh, and um, uh, in other instances, uh, there's, uh, especially in Canada, concern about um, the uh, legacy of certain individuals related to um, Indigenous relations. Uh, there are uh, concerns about individuals who've had a historical link to slavery, like they owned slaves uh, even into the 19th century. Um, and a lot of those same individuals were uh, prominent figures in Canadian history. And so in the wake of, um, you know, the anti-racism uh, marches of 2020, in the wake of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of 2015, in the wake of the uh, discovery of unmarked graves at residential schools um, just in the past year, um, we are in the midst of what has been a very wrenching um, process of re-examining history um, and, um, uh, and thinking about ways in which the commemorative landscape has unfairly kept some groups, some individuals out of the collective history that we um, you know, venerate. Uh, and uh, at the same time, um, you know, what, what has kind of emerged is a sense that there are a lot of individuals who are paid tribute to in public memorials and uh, generally in commemorative sites and names and so forth, um, uh, whose uh, ongoing, uh, I guess, validation in these kinds of um, um, public memorials is is problematic uh, for some groups in our society, and um, and that's the process right now that I want to talk about. Um, and 
um, and this will be the controversial part of it, I, that I want to encourage. Um, I think that this is actually a very healthy process that we're embarked on. I know that it's difficult. I know that many people feel very strongly about the preservation of um, uh, heritage sites and uh, certain um, ways that uh, uh, history was embodied in the past. Um, but I feel that um, for Canada to be the peaceable nation uh, that it um, uh, was intended to be um, in the future, I think it's really important that, um, uh, that Canada evolve its commemorative landscape. And that's going to be the central message that I'm bringing to this talk tonight. Um, so, um, oh, I gotta click on this to get things moving. Okay. So I'm just repeating myself here, but obviously there have been numerous controversies that have erupted across the country. Um, the top picture there uh, shows Ryerson University, which we know um, the university has decided this year that um, uh, it's going to be renamed um, because of uh, Egert and Ryerson's um, seminal role in the creation of residential schools. Um, the Sir John A. McDonald Parkway is still the name attached to this parkway uh, that uh, runs um, sort of across the west side of Ottawa, uh, along the Ottawa River, but it is under fire and there is a, there is a push to rename that parkway. Um, and recently the uh, Sir John A. Macdonald ski trail that runs a parallel to the parkway uh, was renamed, in fact. Um, uh, the Kitchissippi, uh, Kitchissippi um, um, ski trail, um, rather than the Sir John A. Macdonald ski trail. So that's um, that was a, a one immediate concession to this sort of um, uh, notion that we should be changing uh, some of the some of the commemorations related to Sir John A. Macdonald, uh, mainly because of his role as the government leader during the time when the residential schools were established, but also for other um, uh, statements and positions he held uh, related to, for example, um, the Chinese workers who um, uh, helped build the railway and wanted to settle in Canada um, and, um, uh, and other major sort of clashes with indigenous peoples. Um, and then this other image is just showing the Vaughan Secondary School in Vaughan, um, Ontario, uh, outside of or in, in the Greater Toronto area, um, uh, uh, Benjamin Vaughn uh, was also a slave owner, but whose name is commemorated in um, uh, in the Toronto area, and it was the subject of a uh, debate about um, the possible changing of the name of that school. Uh, not at this point uh, a debate about changing the name of the municipality, Vaughn, uh, but that may yet come. So this has been ongoing for a number of years. Um, uh, there's no easy way to sort of mark the beginning of this push for change. Um, but I think uh, 2017 was um, uh, certainly um, a milestone along the way. Um, uh, that's the year that the Langevin block, um, a very well-known building in downtown Ottawa across from Parliament Hill, or on Parliament Hill, depending on how you define it, um, uh, was rather summarily renamed um, the Office of the Prime Minister and Privy Council um, uh, uh, in order to, uh, I guess, acknowledge concerns among Indigenous people and others that uh, it had been named for Sir Hector Louis Langevin, um, who um, uh, was uh, considered a prime architect in his ministerial role of the residential school system. And likewise, in uh, Calgary, uh, Langevin Bridge was renamed Reconciliation Bridge for the same reason. Um, in 2018, there was the beginning of a very contentious um, uh, debate over a statue of Sir John A. Macdonald that was positioned uh, outside of Victoria's City Hall in, um, in the capital of British Columbia. Um, uh, likewise, uh, there has been ongoing uh, concerns about a statue of Edward Cornwallis in uh, downtown Halifax and um, in, uh, in the ensuing months and years, both of those statues were removed. 
Um, this is from 2019 when the Sir John A. Macdonald statue in Montreal was actually still standing. Um, uh, it's since come down. Uh, and, um, uh, but that's a, a long time uh, battle over that particular uh, monument. Um, and, I, and I've included here as well an example from the United States, um, uh, a lot of the Confederate monuments uh, in the in the southern uh, U.S. have come under fire and have uh, created controversy, and there's been a lot of um, uh, change to the commemorative landscape in the United States in response to um, anger about um, certain memorials that paid tribute to the era of the Confederacy, uh, particularly, obviously, um, from those pointing out that it was a uh, a movement to defend slavery. Um, other examples uh, abound, really. I mean, um, uh, there's really, you're going to see a lot of examples over the course of this presentation about the ways in which um, contentious aspects of history and contentious figures from history um, are being um, uh, targeted for um, changes uh, in the commemorative landscape in the case of for example, Jeffrey Amherst, um, whose um, uh, treatment of indigenous people and um, his, uh, uh, you know, suggestion that they uh, should be eradicated. Um, uh, uh, his name from a Montreal street was uh, removed. Um, that, I guess, began in 2019 or it completed in 2019. I can't quite remember. Um, other examples continued in the following year 2020 um, uh, Dundas Street in Toronto has in fact been um, uh, uh, is, or is in the process I guess of being um, stripped um, and renamed um, there's a lot of concern around William Osler for some of the statements that he made of course he's a renowned physician um, and his name is attached um, to a major institute in Toronto. Um, and um, there's concerns about some of the ideas that he was um, uh, speaking uh, during his life. Um, and here, um, an example that hit pretty close to home in Ottawa, uh, concerns around the Upper Canada Administrator, Peter Russell, who was uh, not only a slave owner, but um, took steps to resist the abolition of slavery in Upper Canada in the early 19th century. Um, uh, Russell Township, uh, just outside of Ottawa, um, is, uh, is named for Peter Russell. And of course, um, as a result of Russell Township being so close to Ottawa, there are actually a number of names um, uh, connected to Peter Russell uh, within the city of Ottawa, such as Russell Road or Russell Avenue in Sandy Hill or Russell House Residence at Carleton University. Um, and so um, uh, the township of Russell has begun a process of not renaming the township, but choosing a different namesake. Um, and uh, we can talk about that. Um, I've, I've written about it. I don't think that's a particularly good idea. I don't think it's a, a very uh, um, bold response uh, to the concerns about uh, the original namesake of the township, um, but that's one example of a step that has been taken um, uh, to respond to some of these criticisms. Um, statues of John A. Macdonald, as I mentioned before, are under fire across the country. Um, uh, a Coast Guard ship named after Edward Cornwallis has been renamed, in fact, and as I mentioned before, Ryerson University has already embarked on a process of renaming itself. And um, in addition to that, a statue that had been um, paying tribute uh, to uh, the namesake of the university uh, was uh, torn down and is removed from the university. Um, I alluded to it before, but I think there are actually, in, in Canada's uh, case, four main um, reasons, I think, why we are going through this debate and these changes around the commemorative landscape. Um, I think it began in a significant way with the 200th anniversary of the birth of John A. MacDonald. Um, uh, that um, milestone moment prompted a lot of thinking about MacDonald's legacy. Um, uh, I attended a conference actually in early 2015 in Scotland 
um, I, I, my particular topic in that, um, in that conference was uh, sort of having another look at John A. Macdonald's relationship with the media of his day, in other words, the newspapers, um, and just um, examining how um, manipulative and um, I guess from a Machiavellian point of view, a kind of a brilliant tactician, um, but um, uh, from a um, sort of uh, a journalistic perspective, uh, he was um, um, he was a, 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 a tremendously slippery uh, and uh, manipulative character. Um, but at the same time, when I was in Scotland, I was um, raising concerns about the fate of a building in the city that I thought was actually. Um, and that some research indicated may have been the birthplace of Johnny McDonald, and then it was still um, in existence. So, um, you know, my own take on this particular um, key figure from Canadian history is that um, his story is certainly worth knowing um, uh, in terms of his uh, uh, place in Canadian history and the value of heritage objects related to Johnny McDonald's really important. Um, at the same time, there's been a lot of criticism over the last uh, five or six years about John A. Macdonald's role in um, uh, especially the, um, the establishment of residential schools. Um, he was always controversial for a decision related to the hanging of Louis Riel, as um, many of us will remember um, from you know, decades of debate over that subject. Uh, but uh, for sure, John A. Macdonald has come under a spotlight in recent years, and that's why um, uh, monuments related to McDonald, building names, um, names of streets, etc., cetera, um, have been targeted for criticism and for a push for change. Um, the other thing I think, um, uh, the other couple of things that I believe is driving this is the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report from 2015, um, which uh, again, I think put, um, uh, uh, put, a, put a spotlight on Indigenous history in this country and um, I think compelled Canadians to take a closer look and a critical look at um, uh, you know, the colonization of this continent, uh, the treatment of Indigenous nations across the generations, the, um, the ongoing um, uh, harm uh, and, uh, that, that flowed from um, historical injustices. Uh, and so um, I think that that has been uh, a key driver as well of this re-examination of not just our history in general, but more specifically, the public history, the memorials, the street names, um, the way in which, um, you know, um, history is embedded in the landscape. Um, uh, there's no question as well that um, the 2020 uh, police killing of George Floyd in the United States and the subsequent uh, anti-racism protests that um, occurred across North America and beyond um, was as well an important driver of re-examination of uh, historical monuments, uh, of street names. Um, uh, it especially obviously, um, you know, uh, compelled uh, a re-examination related to uh, individuals um, and their relationship with um, black people. Uh, and so um, that has contributed to uh, a, uh, a significant rethink on that front. Um, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, the BIPOC community is re-examining um, uh, these historical uh, commemorations and memorials and monuments. Uh, and finally, I think the other thing that, uh, again, gave impetus to the ongoing and I would say accelerating push for change was um, uh, the discovery of children's unmarked graves at residential sites during the past year. Um, uh, it obviously struck Canadians very deeply. Um, it, um, as we know, flags uh, across the country uh, were lowered for most of the past year in, on, in I guess, uh, in, to mark um, the tragedy that clearly occurred in residential schools. And that again has simply pushed 
um, and, uh, and added impetus to this movement to re-examine historical commemoration. Um, that said, um, it isn't the first time in Canadian history that, um, you know, um, uh, municipalities and um, institutions have uh, looked at um, the history that is commemorated and decided that change needed to happen. Probably one of the most um, memorable examples in Canadian history is when the city of Berlin in southern Ontario became the city of Kitchener during the First World War because guess what, um, having the name Berlin during a war in which the, um, uh, the enemy was um, uh, the German city, of, uh, was, was Germany, um, having, having a name uh, of Berlin was not considered um, uh, good for morale. Uh, it wasn't actually good for commerce because um, some of the goods manufactured in the city of Berlin were, um, were not finding markets because of, uh, because of the insignia made in Berlin. Uh, so there were a lot of reasons why the city decided to, um, uh, you know, to, to change its name. And it wasn't an uncontroversial uh, thing. There were a lot of people who wanted to keep the name. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, but it was, uh, but it was very contentious. Um, and in the end, um, uh, there was a vote, and you can see on that bottom right um, picture the ballot of the different names that uh, were on the ballot for, um, uh, for changing the name. And in the end, Kitchener won out, um, and that's because Lord Kitchener had actually just died during the, one of the, the battles in the uh, First World War, and uh, there was a desire to pay tribute and homage to um, this war hero. Um, uh, at the same time, a bust of Kaiser Wilhelm that had been on um, display in a park in Kitchener was vandalized, um, thrown in a lake, um, uh, and um, it just, I guess, goes to show that some of these um, events and battles that we're witnessing today in our time um, have happened in the past as well. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, we, we know that from our own history here in the former Bytown, uh, that change takes place um, when it comes to commemorative names. Um, uh, there was a point in the 1850s when uh, the leaders of Bytown believed that the name itself seemed uh, too parochial, too old fashioned. Um, it had the, had the word town in it when they were aspiring to become not just a city, but the capital city of the Canadas. And so um, there was a push by the, um, uh, by the political and uh, business elite in, um, this, in the town of Bytown to become the city of Ottawa. And of course, we all know what happened in 1855. And that's why we're here today as the, um, you know, the um, historical uh, society of Ottawa. Um, I think there are other things happening here, sort of undercurrents um, in, the, in the world of history uh, that are, again, driving this process. Um, we know that um, there was a, a battle, a well-known battle in the 1990s, um, sort of between um, historians who felt that there needed to be a unifying narrative for the country's history, and um, I'd say a new generation of historians who wanted to explore um, so-called aspects of social history and different, um, you could say, silos of uh, 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 different ethnocultural histories and labor history and um, uh, different um, uh, probes deeply into different areas of experience in Canada's past. Um, and that created a, a, a great tension, a lot of debate. Um, and ultimately, I think what's happened is that um, those um, social history, multi-perspective um, uh, scholars um, have more or less won the day, if you like. And so there is an explosion in um, uh, research and investigation into um, uh, different groups in society and, um, uh, you know, how they experienced uh, the past, including, for example, women and low-income people and Indigenous people um, and, and other ethnocultural groups um, across the land. Um, and so we've had this shift, I think, 
in um, what is considered uh, legitimate and important history. Um, and it's not coincidental that during this era, you know, the Canadian Historical, uh, the, the Canadian Historical Association, sort of the, the you know, uh, a key authority, if you like, for the discipline, um, renamed its uh, main award, um, uh, you know, uh, which used to be called the John A. Macdonald uh, Award um, in History. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit now about some of the things that I've written about um, uh, over these years. Um, I just need to kind of underscore that I spent about a, a good 10 years anyway as a national writer with um, what is now Post Media News, but then it was Can West News and it was the old Southern News um, by the time I got there. Um, you know, and I spent um, a good portion of my time as a journalist writing about history. I don't know how many stories exactly I've written about Sir John A. Macdonald, but I can tell you it numbers in the dozens. Um, and, um, uh, and there weren't many subjects, including um, sort of uh, narratives about uh, the discovery era in Canada, um, you know, um, uh, John Cabot and Samuel de Champlain and Jacques Cartier and all of the classic sort of um, uh, early discoverers of Canada. And of course, I use the word discoverer purposely, erroneously, as uh, uh, we all know now um, uh, that those uh, individuals weren't really discovering the new world. They were just uh, rediscovering what indigenous nations um, had discovered um, uh, millennia uh, earlier. Uh, but it was a fascination for me to write about indigenous history, but also um, the history of these different waves of colonization, um, uh, about discoveries that were taking place in Canadian history, um, and, and disputes and battles uh, over history. Uh, and so um, uh, it was a very fruitful area of journalism for me. Uh, it was not an area of coverage that very many Canadian journalists were interested in. And so it was kind of an untilled field, I guess you could say. Um, and so that I've continued to do um, uh, to the present time, really, although about 10 years ago, I became a full-time professor at Carleton. Um, and uh, it just happens that, um, you know, at the time of the 200th anniversary of John A. Macdonald's birth, I edited a, a selection of uh, essays from a number of distinguished Canadians uh, who were writing about sort of the legacy of John A. Macdonald, the good, the bad, and the ugly. That was really what we intended when we put together this um, publication. Uh, uh, is, it, it was uh, published under the Association for Canadian Studies, which I've, colla I've collaborated with on a number of occasions over the years. Um, you know, and my own take on this was that, um, you know, this was it, was, it was a good time. Uh, to take a new look at Sir John A. Macdonald and his particular legacy and the historical forces, um, you know, that were at play in um, early Canada. Um, and um, uh, I'm, I'm guess, uh, I guess I will claim to have at least predicted that, that we would be coming to this point where there would be a lot of um, controversy surrounding Macdonald. As I note here, um, you know, there's been a greater embrace in recent decades of a probingly critical approach to re-understanding Canadian history, and that ensured that no cliched, one-dimensional Sir John A. would survive very far into the 21st century, and we're certainly seeing that. There is a lot of debate over the legacy of John A. Macdonald, um, what accomplishments um, he uh, certainly had um, have been set against what we now perceive to be um, failures. Um, and significant ones that have uh, inflicted a lot of harm, especially on First Nations in Canada. Um, in 2018, um, when that uh, controversy at Victoria City Hall uh, flared into a pretty big issue across the country, um, I tried to stake out a position that I felt was the right one. Um, naturally, that's what political columnists do. And, um, you know, uh, I, in my in my years as a professor, I have um, turned more towards political commentary, I guess, in my own writing. Um, although I still tend to be writing about historical subjects as I did when I was a reporter. Um, and my feeling about this was that, um, you know, the removal of one statue uh, outside of Victoria City Hall 
um, especially at a time when that city was attempting to uh, embark on um, a process of reconciliation with Indigenous leaders in, um, um, you know, on Vancouver Island and British Columbia generally, um, was uh, a very small price to pay um, uh, to um, keep uh, good relations with uh, the people that needed to be participating in reconciliation activities, and that was certainly the Indigenous leaders. Um, and they, every time they went into um, Victoria City Hall, had to pass this statue of uh, John A. Macdonald, which they felt was an insult because um, in case you haven't heard over the last number of years, um, Indigenous leaders in this country are not fond of John A. Macdonald as a symbol um, or the legacy of his policies. Uh, and so um, I felt like, um, you know, uh, uh, the removal of a statue was not a huge issue. Um, it was, I, I recognized that it would be, uh, it would inflame a lot of passions, um, but, I, but I didn't feel that it was important enough, especially because that statue had only been there for a couple of decades, um, uh, that it was, um, you know, that it was worth, uh, you know, essentially uh, dis disrupting the reconciliation talks that um, really needed to go on in that city. And ultimately, that's what the city leaders um, decided should happen and the and the statue was removed but it's been very controversial and it continues to be um, um, a few years later after the anti-racism protests of 2020 um, as I mentioned before um, figures like Peter Russell the um, administrator in Upper Canada um, his um, imprint on the commemorative landscape uh, came under fire. There's um, uh, landmarks in Toronto named after Russell, uh, which um, drew a lot of controversy. And as I mentioned, uh, there was a controversy that emerged in Russell Township, just outside of Ottawa. Um, and uh, that sort of indirectly uh, leads to uh, raising questions about other landmarks named after Peter Russell. Um, as I argued in um, a, 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 a column in the Ottawa Citizen, um, I really feel like Peter Russell is, uh, as I say here, one guy from Canadian history we do not need to honour. Um, his most uh, famous um, sort of uh, character attribute seemed to be his strong defence of slavery at a time when the rest of uh, uh, Canada and the United Kingdom were really trying to move away from what was, um, you know, obviously uh, an atrocious, um, uh, you know, um, marketplace in um, human beings. Um, and, and the other thing that Peter Russell was well known for was, um, you know, using his position of power to enrich himself. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I, I just felt like once a lot of this came to light, especially in the context of all of this other, um, you know, sort of thirst for change in the commemorative landscape, that um, that is one name um, that we should, in fact, expunge, uh, because there is not really a good reason for that particular individual to be so honored on the landscape. Um, and the idea that I was um, trying to push, I guess, in that particular column, I took sort of to the next level, um, writing for iPolitics. Um, I really felt like, you know, it's important for political jurisdictions really to get ahead of this issue. I guess that's kind of what I was arguing. Um, I felt that it was important for um, the government of Canada, ultimately, but other jurisdictions like the city of Ottawa, the city of Toronto, the province of Ontario, elsewhere, um, you know, to get a handle on what exactly was happening um, in the, uh, uh, in a sense, the grassroots um, activist communities, which um, were very clearly targeting, um, you know, uh, a whole swath of historical figures um, and um, uh, commemorative names, and that it was important to, um, I, I would say, to put a frame of uh, a, a methodical process around this so that um, different communities could have input into an orderly uh, process for 
re-examining the commemorative landscape and coming up with thoughtful solutions and thinking about the full range of ways in which the commemorative landscape could be um, modernized and updated and where derogatory um, landmarks could be um, immediately changed uh, because I don't think, uh, you know, explicit racism, um, you know, in um, natural features that, for example, used the N-word should be allowed to persist. And there are a number of examples, um, you know, across Canada's landscape of derogatory terms referring to Indigenous people that are still on maps and um, uh, in um, various kinds of place names and so forth. And so that was my argument in this iPolitics piece was essentially that we need to, um, you know, take this debate the Canadian way, which is to essentially form committees and have um, thoughtful discussions, give everyone the chance to um, air their viewpoints, um, and then have uh, democratic decisions, um, you know, based on community values in different places across the country. Not every community would probably end up making the same kinds of decisions depending on historical circumstances and so forth, but that that's the appropriate way to deal with this, not on a um, case by case basis, lurching from crisis to crisis, um, you know, reacting to vandalism in, um, you know, sort of uh, 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 a state of emergency. I didn't feel that was the appropriate thing. Um, and uh, there were issues that arose in the midst of all this. Uh, for example, um, Scott Moffat, who's the counselor for um, uh, what was called Rita Goulburn Ward uh, in uh, Ottawa, um, uh, explored the history of the namesake Henry Goulburn and um, uh, determined that um, his connection to, um, uh, to a slave operation in Jamaica made it inappropriate for that name to be as honored as it was in the um, uh, in the name of the city ward. Um, my I, I actually agreed with uh, Scott about um, you know the need for that name to be um, uh, removed, uh, but I disagreed with um, his approach was which was essentially um, he just declared he was no longer going to use the name and that um, henceforth. Uh, it would not be called Rito Goulburn. Um, I felt important in, in trying to be consistent with my previous uh, arguments is that, it's, it, it, is that it was really crucial for there to be a proper process for change um, and, for, um, and for communities to have the opportunity for input and debate and discussion. And that um, if we weren't able to do that, then um, uh, you know, then we were really going to be in for trouble because people um, people need to feel that they are um, uh, contributing to a democratic conversation when these decisions are made. Um, and by the way, I mean I'm including lots of slides with lots of writing um, on it. Um, uh, it's I don't expect everyone to be reading all of the stuff that I've included here, but I know that the recording of this talk is going to be placed on the Historical Society website, so I was partly thinking of this as um, perhaps a resource uh, that people can go back and look at if they're interested in particular parts of it, and of, of course answer, uh, ask all kinds of questions tonight, but people can continue to ask me questions. I'm very easy to find um, um, and happy to uh, discuss and debate these things um, um, uh, going forward. Um, there has been backlash, there has been um, uh, uh, resistance, I would say, to change on the commemorative landscape. Um, certainly, when um, uh, current conservative leader Aaron O'Toole launched his campaign for the leadership, um, he really made as a central focus um, uh, the idea that he was going to be the defender of Canadian heritage and history and was going to resist what he described as erasing Canadian history. Um, and. Um, I take issue with that characterization of what's happening on the commemorative landscape. Um, I don't believe, for example, that um, you know, uh, removing some of the um, commemorations of Sir John A. Macdonald is going to somehow um, magically result in us forgetting that he was the first prime minister of the country. 
um, or that we're going to forget uh, the other accomplishments um, in his political career. Um, I would say it is, in fact, a broadening of the canvas of history to include more understanding of what traditionally we've overlooked or avoided thinking about um, or um, actively, um, you know, uh, covered up as in the case of, I think, a lot of the aspects of the residential school system. Uh, so um, I also think that part of what has to happen is not simply removing names and destroying statues, but, um, but um, targeting uh, new commemorations, um, uh, you know, new opportunities to commemorate a wider diversity of um, you know, the story of Canada. Um, and I'll, I'll get to an example of that um, where um, I, I talk about uh, the renaming of a bridge in Ottawa that is, um, ha has already happened. Um, oh, and I guess I've just reached that point in my talk. Um, so, uh, you know, again, one of the columns I, I wrote in the vein of this commemoration controversy um, had to do with the plan that the city of Ottawa has to uh, refurbish and repurpose the Prince of Wales rail bridge uh, that goes across uh, the Ottawa River, um, uh, uh, touching on uh, Lemieux Island and uh, reaching Gatineau. Um, uh, my feeling was that this was a perfect opportunity since it was gonna be turned into a, an active transportation bridge encouraging cycling and pedestrian movement, um, that it was also a good time to rename the bridge. Um, so I wrote a piece about this in the Ottawa Citizen, um, uh, arguing that a good namesake for this would be uh, Chief William Commanda, a very well-known, revered uh, leader of um, the Algonquin Anishinaabe um, uh, people in this region, um, a former chief at Kitigan Zibi. Um, and um, as it happened, uh, it, I guess the mayor um, read the column and decided to pick up on the idea and proposed uh, to Ottawa Council that in fact um, uh, they should rename the Prince of Wales Bridge in honour of Chief William Commanda. Um, part of my argument here was simply that, um, you know, the Prince of Wales, there's lots of things named after the Prince of Wales, in fact, the same man um, you know, who is honored, who was honored for more than a century in the name of the Prince of Wales Bridge is the same individual who um, um, is the namesake of King Edward Avenue in Ottawa, um, that being King Edward VII, uh, Queen Victoria's eldest son. And so, um, you know, there are lots of ways in which we can reinvent our commemorative landscape in order to uh, embrace, as I, you know, as I argued in this case, um, you know, Indigenous history and significant Indigenous builders um, of the country. And I think that um, William Commanda certainly qualifies as such. Um, so, uh, again, just to take us back a little bit through that, this particular one. So, um, you know, there was this announcement of refurbishing the bridge. Um, and that was the trigger for me thinking about um, uh, the, the renaming uh, possibility. Um, as I mentioned, it was named after the Prince of Wales. And part of my research indicated that it was actually, you know, kind of named, it seemed, um, uh, you know, in a, in a real hurry and not with a whole lot of thought. Because basically, in the 19th century, if you name something after a royal personage, then it, um, you know, it, it gave it the veneer of importance and um, um, and, and popularity, um, but it just happened that the name was attached to this bridge after it had become embroiled in a, in a scandal over um, construction costs, essentially, and, um, and, and possible um, inappropriate um, contract negotiations. Um, so, um, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't any fanfare, frankly, when this bridge was named after the Prince of Wales, uh, and it seemed like it was just sort of like an automatic thing um, you know, to attach the name of a royal personage to another um, landmark construction project in the city. Um, and so um, I felt like it was really an example of an expendable namesake uh, from history um, uh, that could be, um, um, you know, re, um, that the object could be renamed to very effective purpose. And that would be in the spirit of reconciliation. Um, it just happened that 
I, in, you know, quite some time ago, almost, I guess it is almost 20 years ago now, um, you know, I met Chief William Commander um, in, a, in, in a sort of a really interesting and poignant circumstance. Um, I'd done some research, um, which I've talked uh, actually about uh, with the Historical Society in a previous um, public talk like this, um, about um, uh, you know the discovery of the true location of uh, of an indigenous burial site, which, as it turns out, um, was on the shore near the Canadian Museum of what is now the Canadian Museum of History. Um, and at that time, um, Elder Commanda came to the site when this news emerged about where the true location of the the burial site was, and he performed ceremonies. Um, we spoke about um, you know what it meant for him that. Um, burials of people who may have been his own ancestors had been dug up by 19th century um, archaeologists slash antiquarians like Edward Van Cortland, uh, someone again who I've spoken uh, about at the uh, Historical Society. Um, so, uh, you know, I got a sense of, um, you know, Elder Commanda's values. I spoke at the time with other Indigenous leaders about this particular issue. Um, and over time, um, Elder Commanda, you know, became uh, extremely well known in the city. Um, uh, he was invited when Nelson Mandela came to Ottawa to uh, to greet uh, Nelson Mandela because um, Elder Commanda had always um, uh, essentially pursued a path of uh, reconciliation uh, between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples and between different nations within the Indigenous community. And so again, like I said, a revered figure who was also, by the way, um, an ardent environmentalist. Uh, and so this all kind of melded together for me um, as, um, you know, this person who has been who has been described over and over again, um, you know, first during his life and, in, um, and um, after he passed away, um, as a bridge builder. Um, and so he seemed like to, just the perfect person, especially with his environmental kind of, um, you know, uh, messaging throughout his life, that the bridge that is meant to be, um, you know, one of Ottawa's responses to climate change um, should be named for him. Um, it's, also, um, it's also in line with what Indigenous leaders in this city have been saying for a long time, which is that, you know, our commemorative landscape in the city doesn't recognize very many Indigenous people, um, even in a generalized way. Uh, I think we're all familiar with the sort of, um, you know, troubling story of the way that the statue of Samuel de Champlain um, had, um, you know, a, a scout figure kneeling and looking up to uh, Champlain um, as if he were a god. Um, that scout was later removed from the statue because of a controversy that surrounded that depiction of the only Indigenous individual in a statue at the time in the city of Ottawa. Uh, and so um, uh, we, have a, we have a history of overlooking um, the Indigenous origins of settlement in this area. Um, and the NCC uh, was urged as early as 2011, just after uh, Commanda's death, um, to take steps to honor him on the landscape. Uh, and so uh, this idea about, um, uh, uh, about uh, renaming the bridge after William Commanda um, was in line with this um, uh, priority of um, uh, local Indigenous leaders. Um, so finally, um, uh, actually I shouldn't say finally because it makes it sound like it took a long time, um, within six months really, of um, six or seven months of uh, Mayor Watson saying that we, he thought that this bridge should be renamed, it was renamed. And the ceremony took place in July. Um, you can see that uh, Toby Nussbaum from the NCC is there behind the mask on the left. Um, uh, that's Catherine McKenna there as well. There are uh, indigenous leaders from, and this is significant, both uh, Pekwakanagan and Kitagon Zibi um, uh, at this ceremony. Um, and, um, you know, we, we, we know that um, the two um, First Nations communities in this area don't agree on everything. In fact, they can, um, they can hotly disagree at times. But on this matter, um, they were united in supporting the renaming of this bridge. And, um, and that's why 
um, you know, Mayor Watts and, and others have described this as a significant reconciliation um, uh, step. It's, you know, it's, it's still symbolic. This is not about solving <laughs> the many, many problems that persist in Indigenous communities in Canada. Um, but it's, um, uh, it's really a small step, but it's proven to be um, uh, uh, a good one that people can get behind. Um, and as an example, um, this was, I think this might have been from the Kitchissippi Times, I should have indicated that here, um, but it's uh, just a story in which um, Elder Claudette Commanda, who is um, William Commanda's granddaughter, described that the renaming of this uh, bridge um, is uh, been embraced, as she put it, it was a nice action by the mayor and city councillors to acknowledge my grandfather in this specific way. Um, and then she goes on to describe his many uh, excellent traits. Um, and, and she says, I believe, um, you know, that this bridge can signify promoting justice, equality and respect amongst all people. It's a pathway to healing and people will walk towards building peace and harmony amongst one another and showing that respect. So again, like I say, a small step, but it, it fits in the right spirit of these times where I think we should be looking for examples of opportunities to um, remake the commemorative landscape to embrace more diversity uh, to frankly give a fairer representation of our history uh, as a country um, uh, because up till now um, large parts of our history have not been adequately represented in this um, um, in uh, commemorative in commemorations and I think that might be the end of my slides. Am I right? Well, yes, just for, that's a, that's a artist illustration of what the bridge, uh, what the repurposed bridge is this essentially going to look like when it's completed um, probably within a year, because I think that's the plan. Okay. okay. Randy, oh, as I say, I think you may have a lot of people agreeing with you tonight because I don't see a lot for questions. I have a couple. Of, okay. But I thought I'd get a lot and I might just throw in one myself. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I'm, I'll leave. Uh, hang on a sec. I'm going to just stop sharing my screen, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, or at least I will uh, knock it down a little bit. Um, uh, I just wanted to maybe draw attention to, to the variety of terms that we may be using when we talk about the commemorative landscape. Um, and, you know, there are obviously some positive words here, like, you know, heroes and patriarchs. Um, although I guess that word can have uh, two different ways of looking at it. But, um, you know, then there are negative ways of seeing these things, colonizers, oppressors. And we know that depending on your perspective, um, there are going to be different perceptions of uh, exactly, um, you know, who has been represented in history and uh, how that's been done. So um, anyway, I'll wrap it up there and um, just um, um, welcome questions and, uh, and comments. Um, and I'll- yeah, we'll, we'll go to some questions yeah. here, but I'll just add one thing, a couple of things that I've noted. You mentioned about sure. the, the Prince of Wales Bridge uh, earlier, and I noticed uh, that recently the, the road that led up to Prince of Wales Bridge was called River Road, and now it's called Onagam Street which is the, uh, the uh, Anishinaabe word for portage. So that is one change that's been made. And I remember when I first moved to Ottawa, there was the controversy over naming the one LRT station that we now know as Pimacy, which I think is a great name and it's an Anishinaabe word. Uh, but some people were kind of frustrated about uh, the area, the busway station used to be known as the Breton Flats, uh, but it has become Pimacy. So there has been uh, opportunities recently where new streets and LRT stations have come in and, and uh, Indigenous names have been chosen. So that's mm -hmm. a step in the right direction. A couple of questions here. Uh, much of the discussion has been led by activists and media pundits. What role should a volunteer-led local heritage group play in this discussion? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, um, okay, now I'm actually going to flip back to the presentation um, because I want to show folks something that's been happening in different jurisdictions. Um, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm popping back and forth, I realize. Um, but um, there, there, are, there is in fact a lot of opportunity for people to have input. 
Um, it's true. I think activists and media pundits probably did help to generate the momentum that has um, taken hold. But it is also the case, and now I'm going to flip through some slides here to get to what I want to talk about. Um, it's also the case that if you look here, um, you know, the Geographic Names Board of Canada has processes underway. Oops, I missed one of them there. Um, you know, where they are re-examining the nomenclature um, in various ways across the country and opening opportunities for people to um, uh, provide input in uh, changing, um, um, you know, processes and commemorations. Um, uh, just an example of how you can um, sort of uh, gain input. Um, the Ontario Human Rights Commission just announced a few weeks ago that it was embarking on a process um, uh, to develop new policies around discriminatory names and words and images. Um, that is really much in line with what I was just talking about in terms of, um, you know, as they po point here, the names of streets, buildings, or landmarks, mascots, um, uh, commemorative days, events, statues, and plaques. That's really the whole shebang. So the Ontario Human Rights Commission is embarking on a public consultation process for people to become involved in, um, uh, I would say, an ongoing project of renaming and um, uh, seeking out new ways of, uh, of commemorating um, different groups in Canadian society. Um, the City of Toronto, um, uh, <laughs> they put together almost a, uh, well, it, I was going to say a Bible, almost 361 page report, which is a summary of all of the different controversies that are happening across Canada and frankly around the world, um, examining how dif different jurisdictions are dealing with the controversies that have emerged around statues, around history, around uh, public memorials. Um, uh, y y people will recall, because this was in the news, Queen's University that embarked on a really sort of a very significant public consultation around the name of the McDonald Hall Law Building at Queen's, um, and they've ultimately decided to change that name. Um, uh, that's sort of, there's just a page of the consultation process that they undertook. Not everyone agreed on faculty, but I think it was, the final vote was 29 to three uh, to rename the building. Um, there it is, 29 to three to rename the building. Um, but the point is there was a process put in place and people had opportunity to voice their views on, um, on the issue. Um, and this is the one I wanted to get to. The city of Ottawa is also embarked uh, fairly recently, you'll see this is just the end of July, on um, a renewed commemoration and naming policy. Um, and um, you'll see that they're trying to emphasize um, you know, the city's rich indigenous history, um, its equity deserving and Im immigrant communities, uh, the different um, parts of the city, urban, suburban, and rural, um, French and English, of course, um, as, as has always been the case in this city. Um, and so they're promoting certain values, obviously, and certain ideas, uh, but they're inviting people in. Um, there's a commemoration policy advisory group that's been struck, um, and they are having meetings on a regular basis, and there's going to be opportunity for public input throughout this. And um, I'll hold it here for a sec, just so you can get an idea of the people who are involved in this advisory committee. It's a pretty wide range of um, uh, experiences. Um, some of the names that might uh, uh, jump out are um, Lynn One White Duck, who's the chair. Um, um, she's an Algonquin from uh, Kitigan Zibi. Um, Chris Dornan's actually a, 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 on the right hand side there is a, a former colleague of mine at Carleton in the journalism school uh, where we worked together for many years and he's uh, been appointed to this. Uh, Jamal Jackson Rogers is the former poet laureate in um, uh, Ottawa and he's part of this committee. Um, I'm just giving you a sense that there's a, um, uh, you know, there's this group who's going to be steering this public consultation process. Um, and finally, there are ways in which every individual can chip in their own ideas about what should happen in the city related to commemoration. So for those, for example, who feel strongly that certain statues shouldn't be touched and that there's an important heritage um, uh, conservation issue or 
um, that, that uh, they disagree with certain steps that are already being taken, well, there's an opportunity to um, directly um, contribute to these discussions that are happening in the city. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing the screen now that I've showed all that. Okay, I noticed there's a lot of questions regarding the residential schools. That seems to be the hot topic. Sure. Uh, and this one might be good for you because you've done a lot of research on Sir John A. And someone comments, I read uh, that Sir John A. was in favor of voluntary attendance at residential schools, not mandatory. Is this correct? I, I, I can't answer the question. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I, I, I can only speak even a little bit partly because where I am now, Ryerson is a part of my city's history. Yeah. And some people are a bit frustrated with the Ryerson situation because I don't think they understand that he was the founder of Ontario school system, but that doesn't necessarily directly link him to residential schools. Uh, and so sometimes I think we also have someone who expressed some concern that there's a little bit of overreaction. I'll see if I can find that question in a second. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll go to the, uh, what do you think of the two in project, TWIN project, which is essentially land development outside the urban area, but approved as an act of reconciliation? Do you know anything about the Twin Project? Yeah, I do. Um, I, I mean, uh, again, I'm not uh, I'm not an expert on the uh, you know the the real estate deal that was struck, and uh, but what I do know is that it has um, generated a lot of controversy, and I think for reconciliation to really work, um, it do, it doesn't work when you have uh, different First Nations groups at odds with each other. And I think that's been the unfortunate outcome of the Tuin project, uh, because it's very clear that uh, one group of, um, you know, Algonquin Anishinaabe in the Ottawa region uh, is not supportive of this and is concerned about um, who's driving it and um, who's involved. And I don't think um, I don't think it works. Um, when, um, uh, when reconciliation projects are pursued that actually divide the Indigenous communities. It's tough. Not, you know, um, First Nations um, are not always going to agree, but I think my sense is in that particular instance that there has been a lot of bad feelings generated by the project. Yeah, here's someone uh, in regard to Ryerson. Someone noticed uh, that he was not an advocate of residential schools. Uh, some, uh, when the Canadian Historic Association made a statement about residential schools arguing for a narrowing of viewpoints, there was a backlash from many ca of Canada's most famous historians. Thoughts from you on when the politics of the day abuses history and historical balance? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, in this particular instance, uh, Ryerson struck a committee of people who looked very closely at um, you know, the legacy of Egerton Ryerson, um, both uh, in terms of his advocacy for public education in the 19th century, as well as his role in the establishment of residential schools. Um, and that university itself, um, of course, pushed by students and pushed by critics, um, came to a conclusion that the continued use of that name for that institution was untenable. Um, and I would argue that... Um, um, uh, they made the right decision, um, uh, that um, there was such ill will surrounding um, the namesake of the university that it was um, running counter to the university's own mission to welcome um, um, diverse populations uh, of the country uh, to, um, to learn there. Um, and that they are embarked on the right process, which is to find a different way of designating the university. Um, so that's, that's about what I would say on that front. Okay, a couple of questions here. Uh, looks like it's come in from the, the Goldburn area of Ottawa. So it looks like some people that are passionate about that. Uh, in considering naming places, would you make a distinction between Dundas, who continue to oppose and advocate against the abolition of slavery, and Sir Henry Goldborn? Uh, who matured from trying to make the conditions of enslaved people better to advocating and for voting in support of abolition of slavery. So it, it, can you make a distinction between those who seem to kind of uh, be uh, some people that were vocal against slavery versus those who just kind of ignored it? Well, I, um, to be honest, I think we're splitting hairs a little bit. What's most important is how uh, people feel about the use of the name 
um, to designate, um, you know, uh, particular buildings or particular jurisdictions. Um, and ask yourselves uh, why that particular name came to be attached to uh, those um, landmarks. And I think that um, not just Scott Moffat's sort of examination of that, but um, my own um, thoughts about how names become attached to certain places is that there is no really super strong reason why Henry Goulburn needed to be uh, memorialized in that particular um, you know, patch of Eastern Ontario. Um, and so in light of the fact that his name you know, triggers serious concern among um, you know, members of our community today who um, wonder why we would venerate or pay tribute to someone um, who was essentially dragging his heels. You know, he, he may have eventually seen the light, um, but he was certainly not at the forefront of the abolition movement in 19th century Britain. And, um, uh, you know, he was, um, um, you, you know, if you, if you look at the whole story of Henry Goulburn, yes, he played a role in British politics. He served in ways that, um, you know, may have supported British and ultimately Canadian interests in the War of 1812. Um, there is this other part of him, uh, of his uh, identity, um, which is troubling. And what I would say is, um, you know, stand in a room with um, representatives of the African Canadian community in this city and justify why some person with very little connection to this country um, deserves the tribute uh, to have a jurisdiction, um, a political ward or uh, other things uh, named after him. I realize it's difficult when a community um, becomes, um, you know, used to the, the use of a particular name. But I think that it's more important for everyone in that community to feel welcome. And um, I don't think that name is going to uh, resonate with um, uh, all of the people in that community. Now, you mentioned that uh, uh, there needs to be discussion over the name of the ward. Uh, but in that discussion, like who does who does the discussing? I guess what I'm suggesting, since yeah. we're all part of the historical society of Ottawa, uh, if you're going to have a for and against, who are the people in that discussion? Assuming the average person who lives in Goldburn writing doesn't really know what it means, the only people that can give any real meaning to the discussion are local historians. So how do we stand on? Well, what I, what should we have. I think community interests are really important. Um, I think that uh, in this case, um, you know, the, the, the ward has been renamed. It's, it's going to become Rideau Jock in the future. Um, it's, uh, it, it's no longer going to be Rideau Goulburn. Um, there are other, like, I live, um, I'm, in, I'm in a house at 209 Goulburn Avenue in Sandy Hill. Um, uh, you know, um, it, it, it will be a mild inconvenience to me if it were determined that Henry Goulburn's um, particular uh, past meant that the city of Ottawa decided to rename Goulburn Avenue. Um, uh, but um, I think that uh, it isn't a big deal. <laughs> I mean, this guy is not somebody who's central to the story of Ottawa. And um, uh, if I have, and I'm sure I do on my street and in the community um, down the street, um, uh, there are, um, you know, uh, black Canadians who knew the real story of who Henry Goulburn was, um, this would not be a welcoming place. And I feel like, um, I feel like it's, a, it's a simple thing to do to update the commemorative landscape when we should, and, um, I would be all for it. Now, uh, one observation I've had is that I've noticed that, the, in, like in most cities, the wards in Ottawa, in addition to having names, also have numbers. I was in Ward 11. Mm -hmm. uh, w what do you think about the possible solution that maybe to avoid a lot of this, that we simply take, get rid of geographic names altogether, if it's going to cause controversy and just simply acknowledge, I live in Ward 12, I live in Ward 3? Well, that be a solution or do you think that's too extreme? 
well, I'm, I'm just, I'm not allergic to controversy. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 I mean, uh, I think that in a democratic society, we can discuss these things and we can make decisions. Um, but I think it's important that we have a process and that we have, um, you know, opportunities for public consultation and public education, because that's part of it. Um, you know, uh, two years ago, I'm sure not too many people in Ottawa knew anything about um, you know, uh, Henry Goulburn, and I'm sure that the same would apply, frankly, to Egerton and Ryerson. Um, so, you know, we learn about these things, then we have discussions, there are going to be people who advocate change, I happen to be one of those people, there are going to be people who um, argue against some of these changes, and um, everyone should be listened to. Um, and I'm open to being persuaded, uh, when new information comes to light that you know, maybe in certain instances, uh, you know, it's important not to make changes. But I'm, but my point is simply this, that it makes sense for it, all jurisdictions to um, embark on this uh, process and to uh, put rules in place, appoint people to think about it and to lead these discussions. That's what we've done here in the city of Ottawa. And I think that's right. Um, and then people have an opportunity to debate and discuss these things, just as we're doing here tonight. Yeah, speaking of discussion, I just want to let people know there's a lot of comments, so go to chat. I'm not going to read them because they're not really questions. They're mostly comments, and they're long, so people are obviously passionate on the subject, so take a look at that. Uh, but one, a couple other things I want to bring up, I know closer to where I am, uh, there is discussion in Toronto of renaming Dundas Street, but I wonder if people realize there's the other side of the story that it will cost the city $6.3 million just to change city facilities, to change the streetcar names and subway stops and all that, and possibly another $16 million more to pay for all the businesses that have to change their letterheads and all that because of the change of street name. Do you think that the fact that you can't just simply change a street name, that there's lots of cost involved. Do you think that that might have some effect on the, the ambition that people have for wanting to change names if they consider the cost involved? I, I, I'm, I'm sure there are costs involved. I don't think in most cases the costs are going to be as um, uh, great as that, um, you know, uh, but um, sometimes it will be, I guess. Um, it's gonna be very costly for Ryerson University to change its name and rebrand itself, that's for sure. And um, I think that in that particular instance, that's a cost that um, it's necessary for that institution and I guess for society collectively, um, since we're all taxpayers, uh, that, that it's important. Here's a good one from a West. Uh, here in Victoria, BC, we have a voluntary program to provide donations for the land that we reside on as an act of personal reconciliation. Amount is based on property tax and supports local Indigenous programs. Is there a similar program in Ottawa? I'm, I'm not aware of it, but um, I, can under- like good idea. I can understand the motivation. Maybe if, uh, does someone else know more about this? Um, I, I mean, if you just want my uh, thought, um, you know, I think there are lots of ways in which people can demonstrate their support for social justice. And um, uh, if it's voluntary, uh, it sounds like it would be, um, you know, um, one of the ways people would want to do exactly that. Um, I'm gonna get in a little bit of trouble here for last minute. I'm gonna ask a question of you. Uh, every year on, on a regular basis, the Historical Society of Ottawa provides funding for maintaining Colonel Bayes grave site in, in France, in, in England, in the UK, which we've always considered such a great idea. He's a city founder. But one could argue that under the, his um, leadership of the construction of the Rideau Canal, that hundreds, maybe a thousand or more Irish and French workers died under his command. Do you think there might be concern that uh, in our own little neighborhood, we might consider having to take the Colonel Bayes statue down? Uh, and I just bring that up because maybe that kind of hits home more than, I mean, Sir John A. and the Prime Minister is on Parliament Hill. That's a national thing. It's kind of like buys our local hero. 
Well, you're talking to a guy who literally went to um, pay homage to Colonel Bai a couple of years ago and wrote a story about it for The Citizen um, with, a, with a chunk of the canal in my hand as a kind of a gift to say, hey, you know, you spent a lot of money on the canal, but boy, now it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And, um, and in that article, I, you know, I did talk about the fact that probably the canal in retrospect is, um, I think the word I chose was an ecological <laughs> atrocity um uh you know every every swamp was drained and um uh you know uh, the 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 landscape was completely um you know engineered for the purposes of uh, boats coming up the <laughs> coming up the um uh, the river and actually i just wrote a series this summer about the rideau river and how i kind of felt like you know the the part in ottawa that isn't the canal is actually liberated from that engineering project so um and that in, I think that story I wrote about Colonel Bai also encompassed the fact that, um, you know, while he may have consulted some of the Indigenous people along the way to help him uh, undertake that survey, uh, there's no question that the canal itself and the settlement of Ottawa was an act of colonization. So um, this is uh, highly complicated, obviously. Um, and, you know, as with all of these debates, um, you know, whether it's a John A. Macdonald statue on Parliament Hill, which I would frankly argue should stay, um, uh, or a, um, you know, S Colonel By statue in Majors Hill Park, um, you know, uh, it'll probably get on the table at some point, there'll be a debate, and uh, we'll see what the, um, you know, how, what emerges out the other end of that process. I think I'd probably, I think I'd probably advocate for keeping the Colonel By statue myself, but. <laughs> well, that's what I think too, but I can see it becoming a discussion. Topic. Well, I mean, we all have skeletons or closets. It gets to the point where you can't really find anyone in history that you can't find something that they've done wrong. And as you mentioned with By, yeah, I mean, the good side is he built the Rideau Canal. He gave this town a purpose, but you can look at the other side and say, well, yeah, he did destroy a lot of the natural landscape and did it without consulting the indigenous people when he, real extent. So it's kind of good and bad at the same time. But at what point do you draw the line between we all do bad things, but do you, do you eliminate every name or do you just decide which ones really deserve to be changed because of something extreme like residential schools or slavery? Like where do you draw the line, I guess? That's, that's the line that needs to be drawn through public consultation and processes. And, and the reality is people are going to raise issues about different individuals or different landmarks. Um, and um, if you have in place a way of um, uh, essentially managing those debates and discussions, um, then people will feel, I think, that, that um, you know, they've, they've had their opportunity to influence um, the outcome. Um, that's kind of how it should work in a free and democratic society, in my view. That's a very, you know, journalistic -y, uh, kind of uh, conception of the world. Um, uh, but anyway, I, I, I think that's the best way to do it. I, what I don't think is a great solution is individuals taking matters into their own hands mm -hmm. and knocking down statues and, you know, tearing down street signs or whatever it might be. I understand the motivation and I realize that if we don't put in place processes and if we don't demonstrate an interest in, I would say, rejuvenating and renovating our commemorative landscape, um, then, um, then, you know, essentially as a society, we invite, um, uh, you know, radical responses. Um, I think it's important. I, like other people will say this, this stuff doesn't mean anything. Um, I think it's important. I think people have strong attachments to history, but I also think that history can be damaging if you're not part of it, um, and if uh, you've been left out of history, or if um, the people who damaged your ancestral generations um, are venerated in the present society, that's the problem. And I take, um, I take seriously when Indigenous leaders say they can't stand the sight of John A. Macdonald, mm -hmm. and, and I don't have a good comeback for that. <laughs> Yeah, just one last comment here because we're, it looks like we've uh, got to the last of our comments. But some, in regard to your rejuvenating the landscape, someone just mentioned here that perhaps commemoration take on more of the role of uh, creation of public art in, yeah. in regard to the way things are named. I, I'm not a very imaginative person when it comes to these uh, other options. I noticed that the city of Ottawa, their, their latest 
way of getting people involved is to say, hey, let's not talk about statues and stuff. Think of other ways in which we can commemorate. And, um, you know, it, to me, it probably means um, some uh, unthinkably horrible public art. Uh, but um, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I shouldn't I shouldn't say that. I just don't. That's not my area. I don't really. I, I find it hard to imagine things other than, say, statues or naming things after people. I, I do like naming things after geographical um, features. That's a safe thing to do, and it's and it's um, it's kind of a wayfinding thing um, it, to me. That that is a good idea. But I also know that we do want to honor people who we feel have been important contributors to our society. Um, you know, do do I have any concerns about Terry Fox Drive in Canada? No, I don't. And I don't think anybody else does either because, um, you know, um, that's an inspiration, right? That's somebody that we want to venerate and hold up as a hero because um, I, I think, you know, um, uh, there's a consensus. And where there is a consensus, I think that that's obviously what we want to strive for. But sometimes there's debate and discussion and there's going to be disagreement. And well, welcome to reality. And confusion too, because when we had a discussion a few days ago, I had mentioned to you that Canadian National was thinking of changing the name of all of its railway yards, uh, which are currently named after presidents, not that they're controversial or anything, like presidents of the railroad, the boards and all that, and just giving them geographic names, which seems logical, but then you made the good point that even some of our geographic names well, as in Goldburn, and, and that are in themselves, you just can't name the yard, let's say Toronto Yard, and use the one example, without having some controversy over how that name came yeah. to be. So it's, it's challenging. Um, uh, Richard, I just wonder if, uh, or, and Lynn, if it's possible to um, uh, liberate people's audio, because then um, we can, uh, people can just ask the questions directly. Um, well, everybody can just unmute themselves. Yeah. Can they? Yeah. If you want to, yeah, as we, I think we that's fair to, uh, because um, but if people do want to, uh, yeah, uh, I feel like I feel like I'm 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 getting off easy here. Um, uh, <laughs> when I'm sure well, there's there's people. a couple of uh, of nice comments here, but they're long. It's, uh, uh, and it's uh, again uh, people more like giving their opinions on how they feel about some of the names. Yeah. Uh, so if some of those people that have written in their chat, if they want to open up the line and talk about what they've written here. Yeah, so I someone just was saying, I'm writing from, it's long though, I'm writing from Kingston on the territory of the Haudenosaunee on the Shinnebat, and what feels like ground zero in re uh, reconsiderations of the role we want John A. McDonald to play in the stories, uh, it would be easy for me to sit, uh, yeah, it would be easy for me to sit comfortably in rut, in a rut teaching the literature of Dickens and all that. I'm trying to find the 19th century becomes more interesting the wider one casts one's net and the further afield one goes beyond one's comfort zone. And bonus, my students love learning about new things. So I think what she's saying there is that when you, well, maybe Heather, if you want to ex expand on that, it seems like in a positive approach to, uh, I'm trying to get some of these shy people to open up their mics. <laughs> but again, if you want to look at it, Sir Henry was instrumental in establishing the founding of the village of Richmond. It was a community where retired soldiers were granted farm land and continued to receive half pay the community was thriving. Let me just move my, get that out of the way. Uh, in conclusion, Sir Henry was important in the contribution of, the, of Canada without invasion from the South until Athenian race. So someone coming in defense of, uh, of uh, Richmond. So again, I think yeah, mostly people offering their opinions that seem to be mostly in the positive that people here seem to want to keep the names the same as they are now, if I'm just looking at them in general. No one seems to be taking the uh, the offer to unmute themselves. I think <laughs> some people are shy. Uh, so maybe if we'll wrap it up then, Randy. I mean, there's a lot of discussion here, but uh, if you want to check some of the comments out, I want to thank everyone for commenting tonight. Uh, and uh, if there are no more questions, I think we'll wrap things up, Randy. As as we expect from you, a controversial uh, topic, uh, and I, I thank you for taking on a controversial topic because we need more discussion like this. So I, I appreciate the fact that you're willing to do this. So thanks, Randy. Once again, you're always uh, uh, a reliable speaker. We, I'm hoping we're counting on you again in the future uh, for more presentations. Okay, well, uh, thanks, so thank Richard. That's nice. Uh, <laughs> I would just with folks um, and, and the discussion, um, they can just reach out and email me and we can have a phone call and um, get together and have a coffee if uh, if COVID allows us to. Um, but I like I, I 
obviously I have a point of view on this subject and um, you know, but I'm certainly open to learning about more, um, you know, historical information about any of the people that we've talked about tonight. I know that these debates, in fact, and discussions are going to continue. That's just the reality now. I think something's been set in motion in recent years, and it's not likely going to stop, which is why municipalities and uh, other jurisdictions are, are essentially creating a bureaucracy around this issue. And um, my own view is that's actually the sensible thing to do, uh, because that way we can have orderly discussions and make sensible decisions. Um, some people will say I'm an apologist for uh, reformists who are going to simply ram change down everyone's throat. Um, uh, but I don't think that has to be the case if people engage in the process and um, make their views known about different issues. So um, anyway. Um, yes. I, just, I just wanted to say that so that people don't feel like um, uh, I got the, the platform to talk for most of this time, which I did. Um, uh, and um, well, you are the guest speaker, so that's what we expected. Yeah, I know. But I'm, but, wondering if this, I'm wondering if this is something in the future. I mean, this is something HSO can be doing once we get COVID over with, is have a couple of public meetings that we host and we discuss this as a group of interested historians. And uh, yeah, we seem to be like the kind of group that should be taking this on when the opportunity arises. So maybe we should get the board together uh, and talk about this in 2022 and see if we can not hold some, and maybe get the city to help us since it seems like the city of Ottawa is interested in facilitating a, a community conversation on this as we go forward. So I think that's when we can expect you to be a lead on that for us, Randy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, as I say, in the meantime, uh, you can always contact Randy by and let him know what you think and give him your opinion. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I want to thank you again, Randy, just a, a, an amazing talk tonight, very controversial. Thank you so much. Uh, as I say, this is our last meeting for 2021, but we will see you in 2022. I just got uh, two quick announcements. Uh, you may have received Ben's uh, emails telling us and posters telling us of upcoming speakers. We had scheduled for January 12th, uh, Rick Henderson who's going to speak about Philemon Wright and the founding of Hull. That one's on hold at the moment because we don't think the library is going to be open. So if you do have that poster, keep it on your computer, keep it tucked on your refrigerator, uh, and we will see how things go. We may try to arrange to have him as a Zoom speaker, or we may take him later on in the year when the library opens again. So for now, we'll put the January 12th talk on hold, but we do know for certain that our next Zoom presentation will be on January 26th, and that will be our very own James Powell, uh, the author of uh, Today in Ottawa, uh, uh, Today in Ottawa's History. That's a blog that you can go check out anytime. And he will be talking, uh, his title would be On Field and Ice, Sporting Vignettes from Old Ottawa. So that will be 7 p.m. January 26th, 2022. So I hope to see you all then in the new year. Until then, everyone have happy holidays, and we will see you all in 2022. And thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you.